This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Part 6, Chapter 11 of Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy the last pages to which the chronicler of these lives would ask the reader's attention are concerned with the scene in and out of Jude's bedroom when leafy summer came round again. His face was now so thin that his old friends would hardly have known him. It was afternoon, and Arabella was at the looking-glass curling her hair, which operation she performed by heating an umbrella stay in the flame of a candle she had lighted, and using it upon the flowing lock. When she had finished this, practised a dimple, and put on her things, she cast her eyes round upon Jude. He seemed to be sleeping, though his position was an elevated one, his malady preventing him lying down. Arabella, hatted, gloved, and ready, sat down and waited, as if expecting someone to come and take her place as nurse. Certain sounds from without revealed that the town was in festivity, though little of the festival, whatever it might have been, could be seen here. Bells began to ring, and the notes came into the room through the open window, and travelled round Jude's head in a hum. They made her restless, and at last she said to herself, Why ever doesn't father come? She looked again at Jude, critically gauged his ebbing life, as she had done so many times during the late months, and glancing at his watch, which was hung up by way of a timepiece, rose impatiently. Still he slept, and coming to a resolution she slipped from the room, closed the door noiselessly, and descended the stairs. The house was empty. The attraction which moved Arabella to go abroad had evidently drawn away the other inmates long before. It was a warm, cloudless, enticing day. She shut the front door, and hastened round into Chief Street, and when, near the theatre, she could hear the notes of the organ, a rehearsal for a coming concert being in progress. She entered under the archway of Oldgate College, where men were putting up awnings round the quadrangle for a ball in the hall that evening. People who had come up from the country for the day were picnicking on the grass, and Arabella walked along the gravel paths and under the aged limes. But finding this place rather dull, she returned to the streets, and watched the carriages drawing up for the concert, numerous dons and their wives, and undergraduates with gay female companions crowding up likewise. When the doors were closed and the concert began, she moved on. The powerful notes of that concert rolled forth through the swinging yellow blinds of the open windows, over the housetops, and into the still air of the lanes. They reached so far as to the room in which Jude lay, and it was about this time that his cough began again, and awakened him. As soon as he could speak, he murmured, his eyes still closed, A little water, please. Nothing but the deserted room received his appeal, and he coughed to exhaustion again, saying, still more feebly, Water, some water, Sue, Arabella. The room remained still as before. Presently he gasped again. Throat. Water. Sue, darling. Drop of water, please. Oh, please. No water came, and the organ notes, faint as a bee's hum, rolled in as before. While he remained, his face changing, shouts and hurrahs came from somewhere in the direction of the river. Ah, oh, yes, the remembrance games, he murmured, and I here, and Sue defiled. The hurrahs were repeated, drowning the faint organ notes. Jude's face changed more. He whispered slowly, his parched lips scarcely moving. Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, There is a man-child conceived. Hurrah! Let that day be darkness. Let not God regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Lo, let that night be solitary, let no joyful voice come therein. Hurrah! Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then had I been at rest. Hurrah! There the prisoners rest together. 
they hear not the voice of the oppressor. The small and the great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Whereof is light given to him that is in misery, and life unto the bitter in soul? Meanwhile Arabella, in her journey to discover what was going on, took a short cut down a narrow street and through an obscure nook into the quad of Cardinal. It was full of bustle and brilliant in the sunlight, with flowers and other preparations for a ball here also. A carpenter nodded to her, one who had formerly been a fellow workman of Jude's. A corridor was in course of erection from the entrance to the hall staircase of gay red and buff bunting. Wagon-loads of boxes containing bright plants in full bloom were being placed about, and the great staircase was covered with red cloth. She nodded to one workman and another, and ascended to the hall on the strength of their acquaintance, where they were putting down a new floor and decorating for the dance. The cathedral bell, close at hand, was sounding for five o'clock service. "'I should not mind having a spin there with a fellow's arm round my waist,' she said to one of the men. "'But, Lord, I must be getting home again. "'There's a lot to do. "'No dancing for me.' "'When she reached home, she was met at the door by Stag "'and one or two other of Jude's fellow stoneworkers. "'We're just going down to the river,' said the former, "'to see the boat bumping. "'But we've called round on our way to ask how your husband is. "'He's sleeping nicely, thank you,' said Arabella. "'That's right. "'Well, now, can't you give yourself half an hour's relaxation, "'Mrs. Forley, and come along with us? "'It would do you good.' "'I should like to go,' said she. "'I've never seen the boat racing, and I hear it is good fun. "'Come along. "'How I wish I could.' "'She looked longingly down the street. "'Wait a minute, then. "'I'll just run up and see how he is now. "'Father's with him, I believe, so I can most likely come.' "'They waited, and she entered. "'Downstairs the inmates were absent as before, "'having, in fact, gone in a body to the river "'where the procession of boats was to pass.' When she reached the bedroom, she found that her father had not even now come. "'Why couldn't he have been here?' she said impatiently. "'He wants to see the boats himself. That's what it is.' However, on looking round to the bed, she brightened, for she saw that Jude was apparently sleeping, though he was not in the usual half-elevated posture necessitated by his cough. He'd slipped down and lay flat. A second glance caused her to start, and she went to the bed. His face was quite white and gradually becoming rigid. She touched his fingers. They were cold, though his body was still warm. She listened at his chest. All was still within. The bumping of near thirty years had ceased. After her first appalled sense of what had happened, the faint notes of a military or other brass band from the river reached her ears, and in a provoked tone she exclaimed, "'To think he should die just now! Why did he die just now?' Then, meditating another moment or two, she went to the door, softly closed it as before, and again descended the stairs. "'Here she is,' said one of the workmen. "'We wondered if you were coming after all. Come along. We must be quick to get a good place. Well, how is he? Sleeping well still? Of course, we don't want to drag you away if—' "'Oh, yes, sleeping quite sound. He won't wait yet,' she said hurriedly. They went with the crowd down Cardinal Street, where they presently reached the bridge, and the gay barges burst upon their view. Thence they passed by a narrow slit down to the riverside path, now dusty, hot, and thronged. Almost as soon as they had arrived, the grand procession of boats began, the oars smacking with a loud kiss on the face of the stream, as they were lowered from the perpendicular. "'Oh, I say, how jolly! I'm glad I've come,' said Arabella. "'And it can't hurt my husband.' my being away. On the opposite side of the river, on the crowded barges, were gorgeous nosegays of feminine beauty, fashionably arrayed in green, pink, blue, and white. The blue flag of the boat club denoted the centre of interest, beneath which a band in red uniform gave out the notes she had already heard in the death chamber. Collegians of all sorts, in canoes with ladies, watching keenly for our boat, darted up and down, while she regarded the lively scene, somebody touched Arabella in the ribs, and looking round she saw Vilbert. "'That filter is operating, you know,' he said with a leer. "'Shame on you to wreck a heart so. "'I shan't talk of love to-day. "'Why not? "'It is a general holiday.' She did not reply. 
Vilbert's arms stole round her waist, which act could be performed unobserved in the crowd. An arch expression overspread Arabella's face at the feel of the arm, but she kept her eyes on the river as if she did not know of the embrace. The crowd surged, pushing Arabella and her friends sometimes nearly into the river, and she would have laughed heartily at the horseplay that succeeded, if the imprint on her mind's eye of the pale statuesque countenance she had lately gazed upon had not sobered her a little. The fun on the water reached the acme of excitement. There were immersions, there were shouts, the race was lost, and won. The pink and blue and yellow ladies retired from the barges, and the people who had watched began to move. "'Well, it's been awfully good,' cried Arabella. "'But I think I must get back to my poor man. Father is there, so far as I know, but I had better get back. What's your hurry? Well, I must go. Dear, dear, this is awkward.' At the narrow gangway, where the people ascended from the riverside path to the bridge, the crowd was literally jammed into one hot mass. Arabella and Vilbert were the rest, and here they remained motionless, Arabella exclaiming, "'Dear, dear!' more and more impatiently, for it had just occurred to her mind that if Jude were discovered to have died alone, an inquest might be deemed necessary. "'What a fidget you are, my love!' said the physician who, being pressed close against her by the throng, had no need of personal effort for contact. Just as well have patience. There's no getting away yet. It was nearly ten minutes before the wedged multitude moved sufficiently to let them pass through. As soon as she got up into the street, Arabella hastened on, forbidding the physician to accompany her further that day. She did not go straight to her house, but to the abode of a woman who performed the last necessary offices for the poor are dead, where she knocked. My husband had just gone, poor soul, she said. Can you come and lay him out? Arabella waited a few minutes, and the two women went along, elbowing their way through the stream of fashionable people pouring out of Cardinal Meadow, and being nearly knocked down by the carriages. I must call at the sexton's about the bell, too, said Arabella. It's just round here, isn't it? I'll meet you at my door. By ten o'clock that night Jude was lying on the bedstead at his lodging, covered with a sheet and straight as an arrow. Through the partly open window the joyous throb of a waltz entered from the ballroom at Cardinal. Two days later, when the sky was equally cloudless and the air equally still, two persons stood beside Jude's open coffin in the same little bedroom. On one side was Arabella, on the other the widow Edlin. They were both looking at Jude's face the worn old eyelids of Mrs. Edlin being red. "'How beautiful he is!' said she. "'Yes, he's a handsome corpse,' said Arabella. The window was still open to ventilate the room, and it being about noontide, the clear air was motionless and quiet without. From a distance came voices, and an apparent noise of persons stamping. "'What's that?' murmured the old woman. "'Ah, oh, that's the doctor in the theatre, conferring honorary degrees on the Duke of Hamptonshire, and a lot more illustrious gents of that sort. It's Remembrance Week, you know. The cheers come from the young men. Ay, young and strong-lunged, not like our poor boy here. An occasional word, as from someone making a speech, floated from the open windows of the theatre across to this quiet corner, at which there seemed to be a smile of some sort upon the marble features of Jude while the old, superseded Delphin editions of Virgil and Horace, and the dog-eared Greek testament on the neighbouring shelf, and the few other volumes of the sort that he had not parted with, roughened with stone-dust, where he had been in the habit of catching them up for a few minutes between his labours, seemed to pale to a sickly cast at the sounds. The bells struck out joyously, and their reverberations travelled round the bedroom. Arabella's eyes removed from Jude to Mrs. Edlin. "'Do you think she'll come?' she asked. "'I could not say. She swore not to see him again. "'How's she looking? Tired and miserable, poor heart. Years and years older than when you saw her last. Quite a staid, worn woman now. "'It's the man. She can't stomach him. Even now. "'If Jude had been alive to see her, he would hardly have cared for her any more, perhaps.' "'That's what we don't know. Didn't he ever ask you to send for her, since he came to see her in that strange way?' "'No. Quite the contrary. I offered to send, and he said I was not to let her know how ill he was.' "'Did he forgive her?' "'Not as I know. 
Well, poor little thing. Tis to be believed she's found forgiveness somewhere. She said she'd found peace. She may swear that on her knees to the holy cross upon her necklace till she's hoarse, but it won't be true, said Arabella. She's never found peace since she left his arms, and never will again till she's as he is now. End of Jude the Obscure by Thomas Hardy